Welcome back to my disembodied voice. In today's video, I want to talk through a mental health recovery model called CHIME, which is an acronym we will break down later on and look at each of its five stages through a different movie character. Now, to break things down even more, mental health in the UK focuses heavily on recovery. This means that rather than focus on the illness, we focus on the individual, their resources and strengths, and then we piece together what we have onto what we need, and this helps the individual recover. CHIME involves learning about yourself as a person, your resources and support, and then tapping into beliefs which are spiritually and emotionally congruent, and also about rebuilding a life after a difficult experience. We all experience adversity from time to time, some of us more than others, and whether it's abuse, losing a job, fighting for your voice to be heard, illness, family issues, or even biological or reactive depression, becoming unwell is the easy part and getting better is always the hard part. So for today, let's look at Chime and through our five movie characters, see how they adopt each of the five stages and how, when all put together, the principles of Chime are both positive and beneficial for the person whose mental health is suffering. And for the record, the character journey may not end well, but for context in each stage of how Chime affects their character arc, we can see how they take a step in the right direction or overcome adversity via each stage. Anyway, let's crack on. First things first, what does each letter in the word Chime stand for? Well, Let's start with C, which stands for connectedness, having good relationships and being connected to other people in positive ways. This is characterised by peer support and support groups and support from others in the community. So to start our recovery, the person must have good peer support and social groups, relationships, support from others and the community. H stands for hope and optimism having hope and optimism that recovery is possible and relationships that can support this. It's characterised by motivation to change, positive thinking and value in success and having dreams and aspirations. So for this, our individual would need belief in recovery, motivation to change, hope inspiring relationships and having dreams and aspirations. I. Identity. Regaining a positive sense of self and identifying and overcoming stigma. This means our person would need to rebuild their positive sense of identity and overcome stigmas. Meaning, living a meaningful and purposeful life as defined by the person, not others. It's characterised by spirituality, a meaningful life and social goals. This means our person needs meaning in mental health experience, meaningful life and social roles, meaningful life and social goals. E. Empowerment having control over life, focusing on strengths and taking personal responsibility. And this means our person would need personal responsibility, control over their lives and focusing upon their strengths, not weaknesses. OK, so let's start at the beginning with connectedness. For this stage of Chime, we're going to use Cassie from the film Promising Young Woman. Now, anyone who's followed this channel over the past few months will know I am a big fan of this film as it takes the revenge genre and removes the gratuitous violence for a more psychological manipulation, spends a lot more time with its tormented main character and subverts expectations by killing its protagonist at the end. Sorry, spoilers. Anyway, in a nutshell, Cassie starts the film as an ascorbic, vile, emotionally frozen and hate-filled woman who dreams of nothing else but revenge on the people who failed to help her best friend Nina when she reported her sexual assault and, after Nina committed suicide in despair, was appalled at the world's abdication and lack of justice. So, the film deals with Cassie's doomed arc of getting what retribution she can, but testing her nihilism and slowly infusing a sense of hope, love and optimism throughout the movie is the lovable doofus Ryan, who she starts dating. Being with Ryan helps lower her defence mechanisms of barbed wire firewalls and almost pulls her out from this tailspin, but for a certain video to emerge of him attending Nina's rape and cheering it near the end of the film. However, before the video surfaces, Cassie stands at an emotional crossroads. Should she let the final piece of her jigsaw, 
rapist Al Monroe go free and move on with her life? Or should she send herself to hell by ignoring the chance of having a life with Ryan and choosing vengeance instead? For Cassie, she is pulled out of her tailspin by Ryan and her lonely and tunnel vision consumed life gets imbued with connectedness. Having good relationships and being connected to other people in positive ways, characterised by peer support or support groups, support from others and the community. Now remember, connectedness means we need peer support and social groups, relationships, support from others and support from the community. Ryan is Cassie's support and over time she loves him back by lowering her defences, falling in love and doing things outside of sitting at home and staring at photos of her best friend and living in a frozen moment of a repetitively infecting time loop. Before Ryan, Cassie is going out and pretending to be drunk only to pull the old and watch as the man squirms at the revelation she's just acting. She also snides at her parents, hasn't moved on with life, and generally lives an existence between binary extremes of hate and revenge fantasies. Yet going out with Ryan, attending days out, and having nice meals with long walks, she begins to see what happiness is, and with this supportive relationship and then connecting to a new community, she meets Ryan's parents and impresses them greatly, she finally starts moving on with her life, much to the delight of her parents. Like I said, Cassie is always doomed from the opening frame of Promising Young Woman, but by the midpoint of the film, she begins a journey of near complete recovery and inner peace by focusing on herself, letting go of the past, falling in love with Ryan, getting distracted and getting involved with new activities and building a sense of identity through connectedness, love and support. As stated in my hate video, when we connect and let go of hatred, we move on to acceptance and, with time being a great healer, Cassie is able to build her self-esteem and heals via the distraction and soothing of living a life rather than ruminating on what she cannot change. Being connected to others is the first step in our journey of recovery and, but for a certain video resurfacing, Cassie would have more than likely made a life, although built on a lie, with Ryan and moved on to the second stage of Chime, hope and optimism. So, having hope and optimism that recovery is possible and relationships that support this, it's characterised by a motivation to change, positive thinking and valuing success and having dreams and aspirations. So, for this section, we're going to focus on Luke Skywalker from Star Wars Episode 4, aptly titled A New Hope. Now, we're talking about this film in isolation with a more centralised journey set within one film and I'm completely disregarding his portrayal in The Last Jedi as just don't get me started. So at the start of A New Hope, Luke is living with his aunt and uncle and being kept back because they are afraid of him leaving and joining the academy or being told the truth of who he is and who his father is by old Ben Kenobi, that mad old fossil who lives in the wilderness. Hello there. However, due to two droids and a hologram of his sexually attractive sister, Luke finds old Ben and, because of that, is not at the house when auntie and uncle are flame-grilled by the Empire. Luke has always had dreams about flying off into space, but he's also had doubts and, now with his family gone and all alone, he needs something to anchor to and believe in, be it a cause or a group, otherwise he has nothing left. So Luke already has belief in recovery, motivation to change and a hope inspiring relationship with Obi-Wan and he's always had dreams and aspirations. Luke is devastated by auntie and uncle being flame grilled by the Empire but knows that if he can learn the way of the Force and help people and fight the Empire this would give him motivation and purpose. He has had dreams of being a fighter pilot and those dreams are actualised when he blows up the Death Star at the end of the film, but the inspiring relationship with Obi-Wan, both before Obi-Wan dies and his disembodied voice, oh no, don't worry, I'm not a force ghost, is what fuels his overall hope. Mark Hamill said during his awkward promotion for The Last Jedi that what he loved about Luke was his determination, faith, never say die attitude and his desire to always search for the good in everything. And the reason Luke inspired millions of kids out there, including me when I was a wee lad, is because he never loses himself to pessimism, the dark side, and is always motivated to grasp the nettle and recover from whatever life throws at him. Along the way, he meets a new community of people, 
Han and Leia, and these relationships help him grow. But what I love about Luke's personality is his optimism, motivation, and how Obi-Wan inspires the naive little farmer who is rotting on a planet he can't wait to leave all the way to the becoming the hero who destroyed the Death Star. Motivation and belief are all intrinsically tied to self-esteem, determination and willingness and without them Luke would have been a very different person. And it's his positive thinking which does him credit. His belief in the Force, his optimism that the Rebels will succeed and his determination to save Princess Leia because it's the right thing to do and, unlike Han Solo, not because it just involves money. Okay, next up is identity which is regaining a positive sense of self and identity and overcoming stigma. And for this, we're going to look at Reese Witherspoon's Cheryl from the 2014 movie Wild. I looked at many people for I, but wanting to tackle someone new, I chose a film I was forced to watch one night at home, but ended up falling in love with big time. In Wild, the character Cheryl Strayed is on the cusp of losing herself to drugs and random sex after the death of her mother. Falling into a deep depression, Cheryl's behaviour ruined her marriage and left her a shell of who she once was. So to find herself, she embarks on walking the Pacific Crest Trail, which is over a thousand miles long. Alone but connecting with strangers on the way, Cheryl is only going to recover from her funk by coming to terms with her grief, getting clean and leaving the car crash of her life behind by finding out who she is. So Cheryl needs to rebuild a positive sense of identity, and overcome stigmas. Leaving her life behind and putting herself through hell, our first encounter with her is when she is pulling a toenail out after her well-worn boots have ruined her feet. She then endures challenge after challenge, goes through hardships and eventually succeeds purely because she has to. In her life prior to the toenail pulling incident, Cheryl has dealt with everything via nihilism. Now nihilism means that rather than face her problems and work through things with community and help, she's sunk into a state where life is meaningless, there's nothing to live for, and she blots all the horrors out with drugs and sexual escapades with strangers. Cheryl is in a full tailspin, like Cassie but with different mechanisms, she's heading for catastrophe so by putting herself through the Pacific Crest Trail she knows that she is away from the people who lead her into darkness, has only herself to prove anything to, is removed from the environment which has been toxic and if she does this then it proves to her that she can overcome anything. In other words, if she completes the trail then she's built a sense of resilience and overcome obstacles rather than just give in. Now I mean no disrespect to drug addicts. I was once in a psychiatric hospital as a patient. Yes, I too have hit rock bottom and I met several and marvelled at their stories of recovery. But as they themselves would say, temptation to use was always hardest when life threw them challenges and they knew they had no ingrained coping mechanisms or concrete sense of self to say no. So I really relate to why Cheryl tackles the Pacific Crest Trail because if she survives this, it's all down to her and her alone and she proves that she can overcome things rather than hiding in nihilistic coping mechanisms which are all about avoidance and escapism. And her success of finding her identity, rebuilding herself and her self-esteem at the end is beautifully encapsulated when she reflects on her triumph to Simon and Garfunkel's El Condor Passer at the end of the film. If you haven't seen Wild, do so. I don't particularly like Reese Witherspoon very much, but the movie is brilliant and it's all about finding oneself, getting your life back, overcoming stigmas, meeting new people, suffering, trials by fire and the joy success brings when you find yourself and get that identity back. Cheryl literally goes from being a husk of her former self to her own role model when she crosses that finish line at the end. Okay, now we come to meaning and meaning is about living a meaningful and purposeful life as defined by the person, not others. And it's characterized by spirituality, a meaningful life and social goals. And for this, we're gonna use everyone's favorite Avenger, Iron Man, or to be more precise, his alter ego, Tony Stark. So we're looking at meaning in mental health experience, meaningful life and social roles, and meaningful life and social goals. When we meet Tony in the first Iron Man, he is a self-absorbed narcissist, and upon being captured by terrorists, he is forced to use his wits to escape. 
Witnessing the devastation his weapons have caused and getting a taste of his own mortality, he sets himself a new goal beyond booze and womanising and begins one of the best character journeys ever in the MCU. Tony decides to right his wrongs and put his money to good use by fighting bad guys and stopping his weapons from hurting people. His life goes from selfish aggrandizement to compassion and being part of the Avengers all the way through to bringing a meaningful life which was previously just about nihilism, showing off and self-indulgence. And it's important that he comes out as Iron Man at the end of the film as he sets himself up as a role model and not just a superhero with a secret identity. Yes, it's partly showing off because Tony never stopped showing off to some degree, but now he's showing off for the right reasons, not I'm clever, I'm rich. Instead, it's I'm Iron Man. I'm going to do good. Tony ends up leading the Avengers and, despite resisting this role for some time, he ends up doing it because it gives him purpose, it gives him a goal, and as he says in the Age of Ultron, his goal is to put a suit of armour around the world. Okay, that goes pear-shaped with the arrival of Ultron, but as this is a genuine mistake, it doesn't change Tony's heart and his efforts to do the right thing because, once he finds this new meaning in his life, which is to fight bad guys, he doesn't look back and, although he dies in Endgame, sorry, spoilers, by that point he has a family, he's trounced Thanos and he dies the hero with a heart that he certainly wasn't at the start of Iron Man. Once we have a meaning in life, a goal and a role, we change completely. We're no longer aimless, selfish, we go to the opposite extreme, altruistic, kind, brave and it enriches us. Okay, E empowerment. This is about having control over life, focusing on strengths and taking personal responsibility. Now, what I want to be clear about here when I'm talking about personal empowerment, it's not the kind of empowerment promoted by someone, say, the Spice Girls. It's not about girl power, you're all your own identity, you go girl. It's about internal empowerment, how we actualize ourselves. So, for my final character, I want to look at David Levinson from the movie Independence Day. Now, I wanted to use David because I didn't just want to have a symbol like Wonder Woman or Captain America because their nobility and greatness is already in place and they have strength and superpowers. And for David, like every other character on this list, he starts off in a place where, whilst he's not struggling, he certainly isn't achieving. And considering it's David who saves planet Earth, I want to let a geek get the limelight and show the world you don't have to be hot, physically strong, or look good in your underwear to be a beacon of hope. Although Jeff Goldblum will always be a hottie, let's be honest. So, for empowerment in mental health, we want someone to become stronger, more confident, get more control, and claim their life and their rights back. And this happens when we tap natural resources, use the skills they already have, and use them to create a life with meaning. For David, his marriage has ended because he wasn't ambitious and, despite being something of a computer genius, he stayed in his kind of low-rent job while his wife Connie went off to work in the White House with President Bill Pullman. Anyway, as the aliens encroach and cover the skies with their 15-mile-wide ships, it's David who works out the code hidden in the signal, and it's then David who alerts the president and saves lives, and... Right at the end, it's David who puts the computer virus in the mothership after selling President Bill Pullman his plan of a worldwide strike in a window of just 15 minutes. David goes from being stuck in the past and going nowhere, being shy and introvertedly stagnated, to the man who single-handedly saves the world, and he does this via the three tenets of mental health empowerment. Personal responsibility, control over life, and focusing upon his strengths. And in terms of focusing upon his strengths, considering Connie and his father are so exasperated about him because of David's apathy and career turpitude, the actual prompt of self-belief comes from President Bill Pullman when he urges David to work with the scientists and prove he is as clever as they all hope he is. His former mortal enemy, the man that he thought his wife was having an affair with, is the one that tells him, pull yourself together, show us how clever you are. And David takes that and you can see him almost nodding in the film at that moment of, okay, I'll do this. Then during his time in Area 51, David is in his element and you can see that by finally making the leap he was always scared to, his strengths flourish. He takes responsibility and he saves the planet and by rebonding with Connie and putting his marriage back together along with a relationship with his father, he ends the film as a complete hero, as a complete person. 
And it's at that end of the film, now puffing a cigar with the alien race defeated, we see what someone playing to their strength can do. And David's story is a wonderful arc from being stuck and going nowhere whilst thinking he is happy and refusing to take risks to someone who eventually does take the risks and his achievements blossom because of it. It's pure self-empowerment. And that sums up each character and each stage of Chime. By taking a snapshot and applying the stage to recovery model, we can see people change, grow and blossom, even if it's before a tragic end. It's how life works. We grow and learn and tapping into strengths and loved ones and community resources and learning to live and thrive, real change is possible. And as that's it for this week's video, I will leave you by saying please like, share and subscribe or leave a comment if you want or even a suggestion for a future video. And until next time, I'll catch you later. And a witch came along, did a magic spell And now we've got a switcheroo